Hey there, welcome to Transformative Principle. Just want to let you know that it is time for the Transformative Leadership Summit. That is the annual conference that I put on that is uh, just amazing. This year, our theme is empowerment. We're going to be talking about how to empower yourself and how to empower teachers, how to empower students, and how to empower parents and community leaders. It is going to be fantastic, and I hope that you enjoy it. Please go to transformativeleadershipsummit.com, and you can check that out. You can sign up for your free ticket, and it's going to be a fantastic conference this year that you are going to love. Thank you to our sponsor, Can Do You. Can Do You helps busy principals create the school culture they've always dreamed of through motivational speeches, engaging videos, and leadership camps that are packaged together for schools that want to see real change. Go to candoyou.us slash Jethro to schedule your call today. And if you sign up before the end of the summer, you'll receive a big, huge TV for your lobby to recognize all the amazing things that your students are doing every single day. That's Can Do You. C A N D O, the letter U dot U S slash Jethro. I'm Steve Maletto from Teaching, Learning, Leading K 12, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. And get ready because the learning begins in three. Two, one. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am excited to have Amy McDonald on as my guest today. Amy, thank you so much for being part of Transformative Principle, and thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you. So we are going to talk because I learned about you and the work you're doing in the strangest of places at a technology conference. So can you tell me a little bit about what you do and, of course, lead up to and include flight school? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what we do is we use uh, experiential activities and to teach and support teenagers and adults to understand the power of having a strong web of support, which then hopefully increases their success later in life. When we talk with teens and adults, we make sure that the process is two-sided, right? That they both participate. So we don't ever talk about working or doing for teenagers. We talk about working and doing with teenagers. And this web of support, as these adults and youth connect, They deepen connections to thicken their web of support. They look at not just the teenagers. You know, many uh, social emotional learning curriculums are very youth-based. Like they look at the student and they look at what the youth can do to build their resiliency, to have a stronger place in the world. We look very differently at the youth, of course, but the youth is one part of seven pieces that we look at that makes up what we call the developmental ecology of a youth. We are very strength-based. So everything we do, we look at from a strength-based side, positive side. So we do lots of um, teacher trainings and in-services. And the greatest event that we do for teenagers is we do a flight club. And the flight club is a anywhere from a one to four day event. I live on Prince Wells Island. And on Prince Wells Island, ours are typically three days and two nights. And students come from all over the island. And we spend three days and two nights doing experiential activities, learning about webs of support, learning about how to connect with adults so that adults can um, throw strings to create this web. We eat, sleep, and work in gyms (laughs) wherever we're hosting our flight club. We have as many as 70 kids and 20 adults that come for these um, three-day kind of lock-in events, and we we have fun. Well, it it definitely sounds fun. And so this is done through Kaleidoscope Connect, which is a part of Brightways Learning. Did I get that connection correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a, it's a nonprofit organization that's offices are based in Montana, but they originally started in Alaska and moved their offices to Montana for various reasons of easier access to home for some of the employees and more cost-effective having an office there. 
And so your day-to-day job then is what? So (laughs) it's kind of an interesting concept. I am technically um, an employee of Southeast Island School District. And Southeast Island School District, along with, I think, seven or eight other school districts in the state, I'd have to list some partners with Brightways Learning on some pretty intense Alaska Native Education Program grants. So my position is funded through one of those grants for Southeast Island, but it's fully it's fully funded through that grant. So I work with Brightways developing trainings and flight clubs and working with local people in all of the districts that they work in in Alaska. Okay, and so this is a, a really powerful thing that we just gave a very brief overview. And so I want to dive into a couple of pieces that to help make it make more sense. So kids need support from positive, appropriate pro-social adults in their lives. Can you talk about the webs of support approach and, and what that actually means? Yeah. So we actually use Roy G. Biv mnemonic to explain it to adults and teenagers. And this is how we explain it. So if you think about what does every teenager in this world need, they need love, right? But there are many different ways, many different people view love differently. So we use, if you think of love as the sun up in the sky and it's warm and you shine it through a prism, you get Roy G. Biv, right? The colors of the rainbow. Yep. And so we use that mnemonic in order to explain what love looks like in our story about a web of support. So the first color is red. And there's research out there that shows that it's optimal for teenagers to have five caring and connected adults in their lives. And these adults can be biologically related or they can be adults in the community. It's it's very important to point that out because many teenagers think, well, I don't have five biologically caring and connected adults, so I must not have enough. And we know now in our culture, people move, we're a lot more transient, that those adults aren't necessarily biologically related. So red, we call them our anchors. They're the, our rule of five. We say everybody should have five caring and connected adults. Now, I said earlier that we're really strength-based. Oftentimes, teenagers don't have five caring and connected adults in their lives. And we start wherever they are, and we support them to move forward. So if we had a teenager in one of our events that said, gosh, I only got two, we celebrate two and we provide opportunities for them to connect with other people, other caring and connected adults. So that's red. And then these adults hold what we call strings. Can I ask a question about the the five? Yeah. So uh, there's a fairly famous Jim Rohn quote that says that you are the average of the five people you hang around with most. Yeah. And so that relates to this as well. And so it's intentional here that it is five adults and not just older peers yeah, or, or anything like that. What's the difference between having an adult versus an older sibling or uncle or, or cousin who's not quite truly an adult yet? Yeah. And, and kids ask that question all the time, right? Because there's also a ton of brain research out there that says kids need to connect with other people their age, right? And so... The way we explain it in our story is that a typically like a five-year age difference. So if you're a 15-year-old looking at people that are at least five years older than you, and the way we kind of talk about it is that adults tend to have more life experiences. Uh, adults tend to have more access to resources in some senses. So if you're a teenager who's really, really interested in learning to be a pilot, adults might have access to job opportunities or job shadow opportunities, those kinds of things. We do not ever, though, exclude their friends. We just don't call their friends their anchors, right? So we explain it to them. It's like your five caring and connected adults are like the cake, and your friends can be that frosting on the cake. You need to have that strong base of the cake in order to put the frosting on top of it. Yeah, and I really like that approach because it doesn't take away the need for for peers. It just clearly says, if you don't have five adults in your life, that's something you should be actively searching for yeah. and finding, right? Yeah, exactly. And that, and don't dismiss your friends. It's just in addition to those friends, be looking for adults. Yeah, I like that. That's powerful. All right, let's go on to orange. Okay, so these adults form kind of a circle in, in our story, and they 
it's, it's kind of a, a game between the teenager and the adult that they throw and catch what we call tangible orange and intangible yellow strings. And these strings, tangible strings are things that are easy to answer yes or no, whether you have them. So do you have a safe home? Do you have a safe school? Do you have nutritious food? Do you have appropriate clothing? So those are tangible strings. And those strings are thrown between the adults in your, in your circle. And then the intangible strings are more like virtues and values. So things like integrity and curiosity and a sense of humor, respectfulness, those things. So these orange and yellow strings get thrown around and passed back and forth between the adults and the teenager to create this web of support. In some, in some research, they're called protective factors. We call them strings in our story that build this web of support. So that's orange and yellow. And then, so if you're like in your brain thinking of this picture, you've got these red adults standing around in a circle holding these orange and yellow strings, right? Creates a web. Yep, yep. All right, so green is the balloon itself, which is the teenager. And that teenager, there's just like in any school you walk in, there's teenagers that are different sizes, shapes, colors, um, personalities, right? So just like a balloon, lots of different colors, sizes, shapes. So that balloon, we call it the balloon, the green balloon rests on top of the web of support. And we have a, um, when we, when the kids come to our flight clubs, we have an online survey that they take based on these seven factors that I'm talking about right now. And the green one actually measures the size of the balloon. And there are five factors that um, determine the size of the balloon. The first one being gender. Typically girls are bigger balloons than boys. And they also tend to have more strings in their webs. Now imagine if you're in a room of 70 teenagers and you say that, right? The comments you get. But it's really, yeah. Important, yeah, it's really important to point out that girls tend to stay connected to anything they connect to for longer periods of time than boys. So, you know, unhealthy relationships, they tend to, tend to stay connected longer. And so it's, it's a good thing for girls to remember that although they may be a little bit bigger balloons, sometimes they need to remember what they stay connected to and how they stay connected to it. So that's gender. So the next one we call the wonder gene. And um, the wonder gene is if you're the kind of person that wonders why you're here or what the purpose of something is in your life or where you're going to be in 20 years. Some people might call it spirituality. If you're the person that thinks that way, then uh, you might be a bigger balloon than people who don't. Uh, the next one is pro-social orientation. And people that are pro-social tend to be bigger balloons than people that aren't. And we're real careful to point out to teenagers that that doesn't mean you're the most popular person in the room. It means that you can walk into the room and feel like you belong there, right? You feel comfortable in a room full of people. So Amy, that one is, is particularly interesting because there are so many issues right now that our kids are facing, including gender confusion <laughs> and um, things like that, where, you know, they often don't feel comfortable. And so that, in in many senses, I, I see that being a very small, something that many kids don't have that resiliency already. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And and one of the things that's powerful about measuring the size of the balloon is that it's it's measured by these five different factors. And so if one of those factors, pro-social is a tough one when you're a teenager, right? Tons of brain development that says, they're questioning where they are and, and why they're here and what they should be doing. And their whole, it's Dan Siegel who says it's like this big remodeling of the brain and their brain is like learning and growing faster than any other time in their lives. And, and sometimes that's confusing and right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so one of the powerful pieces of the measuring of the balloon is that that pro-social piece is just a small, just one fifth of the measurement. So teenagers can, can see that that doesn't define them. Only that factor doesn't define them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we, can you review those five again? Cause I think I interrupted you in the middle. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So there's two more I'm going to go through and then I'll go through all five. Of them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the fourth one is grit or optimism and people that tend to have a lot of grit, you know, stick with it is I'm going to get this done no matter what, or who look at the world through kind of an optimistic lens um, tend to be bigger balloons than people who look through it with a pessimistic lens. And then the last one is we don't ever talk about how smart are you? 
when we're working with kids, we talk about how are you smart? There's, you know, Howard Gardner's research on multiple intelligences and students who can identify how they learn tend to be bigger balloons than students who can't for reasons like they can um, advocate for themselves with teachers. You know, if their learning style is different than a teaching's, teacher's teaching style, they can talk to them about it with knowledge saying this is, you know, this would help me. Can you give me something that's kinesthetic for the same concept? You know, those kinds of things to be able to advocate for themselves. So five things, grit and optimism, how am I smart, pro-social orientation, gender, and what we said was the wonder gene. Yeah, so I, I like the idea of, of looking at these things. And uh, recently on the podcast, I interviewed Tom Herr, who wrote about the formative five, which are essentially those five worded a little bit differently, but they have he contends that those are the the skills that kids need. And so if you go to my website, transformativeprincipal.org, you can search for Tom Her H O E R R in the on the right there and you can find that podcast for him. And that that's a really good different way to look at the the same things that you're talking about and just underscore the importance of having those additional things in place for kids that that they actually can do something about like knowing how you are smart versus how smart you are that really changes the conversation and focuses on the skills that kids can start to develop because it's their strength yeah it's fascinating you know Derek Peterson who is the the thought leader of this whole Webster support way of thinking and he's the one that created flight club and he came to southeast island school district actually in the 90s and did some work with some teenagers and uh, teachers and to prove this point but the teenagers kind of threw him for a loop but to prove this point of how am i smart versus how smart am i he asked the teenagers in the room to stand up and from smartest to least smartest to form a line and the teenagers just kind of looked at him for a while. And then finally a couple, one of the, or two of the teenagers were like, Derek, so how do you want to gauge it? Like, what kind of smarts are you talking about? Are you talking about being able to survive out in the woods? Are you talking about book smart? Are you talking about interpersonal smart? And he was like, holy cow, right? These kids know how to talk about who they are and what they, what they can do. And that's a huge confidence and um, esteem booster. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when I think about that, I, I think about how often we underestimate kids and their ability and, you know, think they can't figure these things out on their own, but they, they do and they think about it and we just need to give them space to be able to talk about it with us too and let us into their minds. Right. Right. And you know, one of the, the other thing that's really powerful to me about this whole story is that we have this structure in our society of like a, um, like a power differential, right, between adults and kids. And especially in schools, sometimes I think, you know, oh, I'm the principal or I'm the teacher and you're the student. And one of the things that I think happens when you have this common language and kids know who they are as people and where their strengths lie, that that power differential kind of shifts and it lessens a little bit. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, I'm your teacher, there should be some respect there. But if we can get that power differential a little bit lower, think of the conversations we can have with, with youth that are, so, that are so powerful. Oh, absolutely. I love that idea because once you give them a voice, you allow them to, to be the ones who are contributing in a way that you, as I mentioned, you don't expect them to be able to do, but they totally can. And it's real. Yeah. Yeah, real. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So pretty cool. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay, so let's move on to blue. Yep. Okay, so blue. Blue in our story, um, we call scissors cuts. And we talk about scissors cuts or things that are in control or sometimes out of control of the youth. And there are things that cut away at those strings in their web. So for ex an example of an in control behavior would be too much screen time. Right. If you spend too much time on your phone or on your video game, then it decreases the time that you interact with humans, with people, right? So that might cut some of your strings. One that might be out of con the control of a youth might be one of their anchors is a teacher and that teacher moves away to go to a different school. That doesn't mean that that teacher drops all of those strings, but the way or the number of strings that they hold may change because they're holding from a distance versus uh, right there in the school. So scissors cuts are things 
that happen that can affect the web, that can cut some of those strings in the web. Indigo is caring for the cares, and we uh, recognize and we want all teenagers to recognize that their anchors need a web of support as well. And not that we would ever ask a teenager to be an anchor to an, to an adult, but we might ask them to show real gratitude. So instead of saying, hey, Ms. Smith, thanks for the class today, you might say, hey, Ms. Smith, I really enjoyed class today. That activity we did, specific activity we did was a lot of fun. You know, so showing gratitude that's clear and um, specific. The other thing we might ask them to do as teenagers is to kind of be observant and pay attention to the anchors in their web. So if they notice that an anchor is maybe having an off day and they're comfortable, they could um, access one a different anchor and let that one kind of deal with their situation, right? Not add to it. And then violet is social norms. And social norms we talk about as that wind that goes through your web and positive social norms can lift your web up and help keep that balloon buoyant on top of the web. Uh, negative social norms can be that wind that pushes your web down. And in some areas of the world, those negative social norms are so strong that people choose not to live there, right? We also um, make sure that when we talk to teenagers about social norms, that we validate the idea that um, changing negative social norms is really, really difficult, but amplifying positive social norms is a lot easier. So we try to identify positive social norms that are happening in their schools and communities and talk about ways that they can increase those positive social norms or add value to those positive social norms. So yeah, that's our story. <laughs> yeah. So I love it. And so I'm just going to review those real quick. Red's the rule of five, five anchors, yep. orange and yellow are tangible and intangible uh, strings respectively. Yep. Green is resiliency and growing the balloon yep. and blue is scissor cuts or problem reductions. Mm -hmm. Indigo is caring for the carers and violet is social norms. And we're going to take a brief break here. And we'll, next time we talk, we're going to talk about the survey that kids take at flight school. We're going to talk about all the things that go into that three day, not all the things, but things that go into that three day lock in and talk more about how to actually apply these things in their lives. So we'll be right back with you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to Transformative Principle. I hope you enjoyed that introduction to creating a web of support with Amy McDonald. Next week, we're going to continue talking with her and talk about more aspects of Flight Club and how we start with the strengths of students and how they get people to come to uh, the flight club. I think you're going to really enjoy it. And thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next week.